I don't get my definitions of what Jesus thinks from culture. I get my definitions from what Jesus thinks by looking at what Jesus thought in the Word of God and how that is expressed. Did you know that the first followers of Jesus did not refer to themselves as Christians? As a matter of fact, the word Christian was a derogatory term. It was used as a term of insult to uh, talk about those that follow Jesus. So those are Christians over there. Those are little Christ. It was a derogatory term. It's not the term that Jesus used. The first usage of it we see in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 11, verse 26. It says the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. It's interesting that you don't find that word in the Gospels at all. You find it there in the book of Acts twice, and then you find it in one of Peter's epistles later on. Christian is used three times. Now, it is significant because it is mentioned in the Bible. But again, it was a word that was used as an insult against those that followed Christ. By and large, the word that described God's people was this word, disciple. A disciple. Christian three times, the word disciple 281 times in the New Testament to describe those that follow Jesus. Literally, the word means follower. And so, a disciple is a more accurate and compelling description of what it means to follow Jesus. A follower of Jesus. It's easy to wear a label. Oh, I am a Christian. It's a whole other thing to have the word disciple be an expression of our life. We are a follower of Jesus. A young Hebrew boy, he began studying the scriptures at the age of five. He went to Torah school. Those would be the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. By the age of ten, he was well versed in the first five books of the Bible. He knew it inside and out. The best of that group at the age of 10 were uh, allowed to study the rest of the scriptures that were either in the process of being written or that uh, had been written. And so they spent their life up until the age of 17 doing that. The other boys went to, uh, back to home and they went into the trade of their father, whether that was a fisherman or a carpenter or whatever the trade may be, that's what they did. At the age of 17, if you were really bright and if you were really sharp and you really wanted to focus on your religion, you would find a rabbi, a teacher that you really long to learn from, you looked up to them, and you would go sit at their feet. When you sat at their feet, that was actually an invitation of this. Hey, I want to study under you. It was a request to learn. And so the rabbi would give a Q&A. He would give a battery of tests, and he would ask them about their knowledge of the scriptures. And they always took the smartest, the brightest, the most gifted, because they wanted somebody that would look exactly like them. If, if they had the predisposition that they were not going to listen and they were not going to follow and they were not going to be like them, they would not be chosen. They would follow for years, imitating the rabbi, imitating the teacher, doing what he did, saying what he said. The goal of a disciple, a follower, is to be like the teacher. That is the goal of a disciple. So here in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus begins the process of choosing his disciples. After all, he is a teacher. He is known as a rabbi. The very concept of what I have expressed to you, the disciple, exposes the fact that many who claim to be Christians are not actually disciples of Christ. A disciple is a follower. 
A disciple is a follower. So this passage here, Matthew 4, 18 through 22, gives us five insights into Jesus and those that truly follow him. So follow along with me, beginning with verse 18. As he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John. They were both in a boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So, as I said, I think if I could get to the irreducible minimum of my faith and your faith, it would be these two things today. And that is, are we disciples and are we discipling this morning? And then the question tonight is, have we lost sight of the fact that we are redeemed by the blood of Christ? This is a bloody religion that we are dealing with. It is a religion that is filled with blood and ultimately the blood of Christ that redeems us. And so we never need to lose sight of those two things. And by the way, we do a lot of things at church. We have a lot of different ministries that we might do. We have a lot of different ministries that we should do. Maybe we have a lot of ministries that we shouldn't do. But every ministry that we have, it, if it doesn't smack of either one of these things, then it shouldn't be done or it's being done wrong. It, if if a, a nursery, a music ministry, a teaching ministry, a preaching ministry, if the core essence of that is not to disciple people, then we just need to quit doing it. We are commanded to do that. And Jesus is picking those that will follow him. And I think that we can find something for us in their selection today. So there in verse 18, uh, the first point is this. Jesus does not choose the best. He chooses the willing. Jesus does not choose the best. He chooses the willing. As he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, you know him well, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. So Jesus, this new rabbi, chooses these two individuals, brothers, Peter and Andrew. Quite frankly, this is the B team. This is not the A-team. These are not the valedictorians of their class. This is the B-team. These are the ones that are least likely to be chosen. These are the ones that nobody chose. Jesus does not choose the best. He chooses the willing. Yes, when they're asked, you know what? They immediately, it says, they dropped everything that they were doing to follow. Why is that? Well, nobody else has asked them. Ever. But now Jesus is asking them. And so they want to follow. There's not much potential here. They're not trained. Not, not like uh, the young men that were, went to Torah school. They're not trained in that way. There's not much potential there. There's not much power there, but they want to be like him. They want to know what he knows. They want to know God, how he knows God, and they want the power that he has. He chose the B team. He is going to work through them, not because of them. He didn't choose them for their abilities. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God wants to use each and every one of us anywhere and everywhere that we are. 
He wants to use us at our job. He wants to use us at the school. He wants to use us at the track. He wants to use us at the gym. He wants to use us at the field. He wants to use us at our home. Wherever we may go, Jesus wants to use us there. This passage tells me that there are no excuses. Because Jesus doesn't choose the best. Jesus chooses those that are willing to follow him. If you had told me a long time ago that I would be up here doing this, I'd have told you to your face, you are a liar. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And it confounds me sometimes that he would use it. amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. It is amazing grace, isn't it? But isn't it more amazing the fact that God knew what a wretch I would be after he saved me. And he still went ahead and saved me anyway. And he still chooses to use me if I am willing to be used. Awesome. All he requires is this. Now, I can sense, I've sat in the pew before, and if I'm listening intently enough, I can kind of tell the direction the preacher's going. And so, I, I, I may can sense what you're sensing, and it is this. Oh, preacher's going to, he's going to tell us that we ought to be doing something. Oh, yeah. Because Jesus is telling us that we ought to be doing something. And none of us should ever say, well, it's just, I'm not able Jesus doesn't care about your able. It's all about his able. All he cares about is your availability, not your ability. That's all that he cares about. He doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And he called them and so with that calling comes the equipping. Jesus does not choose the best. He chooses the willing. Secondly, Jesus chose us. We did not choose him. Jesus chose us. He did not choose him. Just those first few words of verse 19. Jesus gives this imperative. Follow me. Man, that's the Christian faith right there. That is it. Follow me, he told them. Now, the normal process was for the best to go to the rabbi and sit at his feet and for the rabbi to give the Q&A and then for the rabbi to go, hmm, no, <laughs> no, no. Yeah, he looks pretty good. That's the usual process. But you know what? You know, with, with a selection, the, the person that's selected to follow, to be a disciple, isn't there... Do you find strength in that? Wherever I'm at, I know this. <laughs> however dark the sky may be, however high the water may rise, However deep the valley is, I know this. God chose me. Is that true of you? God chose you. They, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, did not come to sit at his feet. Jesus went to them. Jesus came searching for them when they had absolutely no mind of him at all. You may be here today and you may be struggling in some area of your life and I would probably suppose that probably everybody here is struggling at some point in their life. You should find solace in this one thing today. If you are a believer, Jesus chose you Whatever you're going through, Jesus chose you. John 15, verse 16. You don't have to turn there. I think we have this for us. You did not choose me, 
But I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit. Did you see that? I chose you, and I chose you for a reason. I appointed you to go and produce fruit, that your fruit should remain, so that whatever you ask in the, in the, fa the Father in my name, he will give you. You didn't choose him. He chose you, and he chose you, and he chose me to produce fruit. He didn't choose us to occupy lumber in a church building. He chose us to produce fruit. Follow me. Oh, well, I'm a Christian. It's easy to wear a label. It's another thing to do what he said. Follow me. Three. Our primary calling is to be with Jesus. That is our primary calling. Verse 19 again, he says, follow me, he told them. You know, he didn't tell them, at least the scriptures don't record it for us. He didn't give them a blueprint. He didn't draw out a, uh, here's the next three years of what we're going to do. He didn't tell them where they were going. He didn't tell them what they were doing. They had no idea what the assignment would be. And yet the Bible says that they followed him. What? We are so apprehensive when it comes to following Jesus. I've sat in camp services before. I've sat in revival services before. And I've had all sorts of bizarre thoughts like this. When the preacher's challenging me to follow Jesus, to commit to Jesus, to surrender to Jesus, and I, all of a sudden, I start having these notions. What, what, what if that's to Africa? <laughs> what if that's over here? What if that's over there? And I don't want to go over here, and I don't want to go over there. These people had no idea where Jesus was going to take them. And as far as I know, they didn't ask. He said, follow me, and they did. His primary call, do not miss this today, because we're church people, we're Baptists. We like to do stuff, right? We're all about doing, and if we ain't doing, then we're not doing something right. His primary call is not to do something. It is to be like him. That is our primary call. So whatever we do, it's to be like him. It's not to do for the sake of doing. That is empty religion. The doing should make us more like Jesus. We have plenty of opportunities <laughs> to become like him, to, to know him. In order to know him, you have to know his word. There are plenty of opportunities, not just here, but in the world at large to know him. Next few weeks and months, we're going to reveal a, a lot of more ways that you can learn to be like Jesus right here at Southside Baptist Church. There are many outlets to do that. The question is, Jesus is serious when he says, follow me. The question is, are we serious in answering that question? Jesus didn't just ask that to ask that expects an answer from that question. Which leads to the fourth point. To follow Jesus, we have to leave all. I think, in my humble opinion, or humble, wherever you're from, either one, we have forgotten this. 
We will forsake it all, as Stephen Curtis Chapman sang at the beginning of our service, for the sake of the call. We got plans, we got dreams. Being a disciple says you don't. Being a disciple says you're going to follow Jesus wherever he leads you. We sing songs like wherever he leads, I'll go. Really? Follow, follow, I will follow Jesus. Do we? He says here in verse 20, Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And in verse 22, Immediately they left the boat and their father and they followed him. So why identify these few things? Really two significant things about their lives and about our lives. The two significant things in the text are this. One, boat and nets, and the other, father. He says, you need to forsake everything to follow him. Their boats and their nets. We look at that kind of like, that's a hobby. That's not a hobby for them. That's their livelihood. That's how they provide for their family. That is their career. And Jesus said, drop your career and follow me. Now do you get the sense of what it means to be a disciple? <laughs> drop everything that you're doing. Drop all the plans that you have created for yourself. And follow me. The way that we provide. And then he also says this. You know, one of your most important relationships, or as it should be, it may not be that way, but it should be, the, the, the father relationship on the earth. And he says, you know, immediately, verse 22, they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. They just left him holding the nets and the boats and the bag, I guess, as it were. For all I know, he may have been elderly. For all I know, uh, there, there may have been some care that needed to take place for him. But Jesus didn't put stipulations on his call. He said, follow me. To follow Jesus, he takes precedence over everything and every one most won't literally lose their parents they may figuratively lose their parents but that's not to say down through history people haven't lost their parents for following Christ God may not tell you to change your job but then again he might They had no idea where they were going. They had no idea about this great adventure that they were about to embark on. That would ultimately lead to death for 11 of them, of the faithful disciples, 10 of the 11, had no idea. But they willingly followed. Most of our lives are not that dramatic in our following of Jesus. And yet... There are moments in our life where we will have to decide, is Jesus going to come first in this moment? Is he? Thank you, brother. Is he going to come first? Well, he should. Fifth, Jesus commands us to spiritually reproduce. Verse 19. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fishers for people. They, they, had already, they know what it means to fish. That's, that's their livelihood. But they'd never fished for men before. So he's going to allow them to do something they have never done before that, quite frankly, they are incapable of doing. But he is going to empower them in order to do that. We need to... We need to 
hone in on this. We're not capable either. Because I know that's the first excuse we give. I can't. I don't know enough scripture. I get nervous. I, the list is endless of things that we give. He knows that. He's the one that made you. He's not interested in that. All he wants is available. Willing. Following him is a recognition of his lordship. It is forsaken all that he has forbidden. It is pursuing all that he has prescribed. He's a fisher of men. If we're going to follow him, so should we be. There is no such thing as a non-reproducing Christian disciple. No such thing. Thing. How do you prove that you are a disciple? How do, you, how do you prove that? Well, you prove that by bearing fruit. If you're not bearing fruit, you have reason to question whether you are a disciple at all. Look at this. John 15, verse 8. We have it. You don't have to turn there. My Father is glorified by this that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Okay, do you see the one word there? I think it's the next slide, Kenny. Pump it. There you go. Look at that. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. That's how you prove it, by producing fruit. Well, what does it mean to bear fruit? Again, sometimes we, we get bogged down in a lot of stuff, and we forget the, the essentials of our faith. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus, his blood, and his righteousness. Matthew 28, he told us what to do, and everything that we do should be around and should be drawn from this one thing. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, the Great Commission. <laughs> Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. There's a lot there, and we might look at that and go, there's too much there, because at the first we might look at four different things. Next slide, Kenny. We got to go. We got to make disciples. We got to baptize them. We got to teach them. And that's just a lot to do. There's only one commandment in that scripture. And the commandment is this. Make disciples. That is it. That is the imperative command of those two scriptures. Those other three things are modifiers of the verb. How you make disciples. Here's how you make disciples. You go. You baptize them, and then you teach them. That's producing fruit. And everything we should do should draw from that right there. Making disciples. If we're not in the disciple-making business, quite frankly, we need to shut the doors and go home. We do. We should be all about making disciples. And if everything we do does not hinge on the fact that we're making a disciple, then we just need to quit doing that or doing that and start doing something else so that we would make disciples. Everything that we do comes with the call to follow Jesus. You be my disciple and you make disciples. Robert Coleman, who was probably the foremost evangelism prof in America. He's almost 100 years of age. He says this in his book, The Master Plan of Evangelism. When we think of evangelism, we think of, well, we need a visitation program. We need this program. We need this strategy. We need that strategy. Here's what he says. Years of wisdom. When will the church learn this lesson? Preaching to the masses although necessary, will never suffice in the work of preparing leaders for evangelism. Nor can occasional prayer meetings and training classes for Christian workers do this job. 
individual women and men are God's method. There it is. It's not a class. It's not a strategy. It's us. We are the method. God's plan for discipleship is not something. It is someone. And someone is us. Someone is we. Can you imagine what it would look like if everyone here today did this and asked God this? God, give me one person that I could bring to Jesus in a year. What would happen? Well, look at you right now. If that happened in one year, we would double our size, would we not? Yes, we would. <laughs> That's the miracle of the book of Acts. That's the miracle of the first church. If every person and every small group made it their goal to reach one person for Jesus... What would happen? If each committed to reach one, what would happen? How is that possible? One, understand God's method. God's method is us. God's method is us. Disciple making is simply this. Teaching someone to follow Jesus as you follow Jesus. Jesus. That's it. Secondly, identify your one. Identify your one. Say, well, I don't know any. Really? You know, you know not one lost person. Identify your one. Say, no, I really don't. No family members. <laughs> no friends. No acquaintances. Said, so, well, I'm not able. Jesus addressed that. All he said was, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. I can't do it, Lord. Yes, son, I know that. But I'm going to do it through you. To amaze the world... So that their jaw would drop to the ground. And so that everybody would not pat you on the back, but give all the glory to me. As we pray.